Well, good morning. We have a real special treat for you this morning. Um, so I had, oh, and by the way, welcome to those of you who are joining us via live stream. We're so glad you're with us. Um, I had a little bio here to read, but it seems to have disappeared from the pulpit. So thankfully, I do know this woman. <laughs> um, I actually had the privilege of getting to meet Reverend Paula, and I don't know if you even remember this. Uh, over 20 years ago, when I was in ministerial school, each year, as we progressed our training, we had to go before a panel to be interviewed to see if we were ready to go to the next level. And it was as I was getting ready for my uh, final year. And Reverend Paula was leading the panel. And she's the one who, when I came back in after they deliberated, who said, we just want to say, go for it. <laughs> and so it's thanks to her. Don't look disappointed. <laughs> but thank you to you for that moment. Um, Reverend Paula and Dr. Mark have been friends long before I got to know her. They actually did their uh, practitioner training together. She has been the senior minister of churches in Ventura, in Orange County. Uh, she is currently serving as a chaplain up in Ventura County. You've moved back up that way. And she is, let me see if I've got this right, mother of three and grandmother of four. And I know she's delighted to be with us today. I certainly am delighted to have her here. And I'm sure you'll join me in welcoming her in with a good North Hollywood church welcome. <laughs> Yes, for no notes. Good job. Thank you. Did a good job for no notes, right? So this isn't my first time to speak to you, but the last time I was here, you were in a tent in the parking lot. The tent in the parking lot experience, I wore a silk dress in August and did two <laughs> services. I think I had to throw the dress away when I was done from the experience. I spoke here um, actually before Dr. Mark came. Uh, I candidated here. And uh, in my prayer and my meditation, I couldn't see how I could get from Orange County or Ventura, the two places that I live, and most of the time kind of in between, but now I'm settled back in Ventura. I know that the minister that you have that leads your community is truly, truly a precious individual, one of my favorite people. So I get to tell a couple stories on him because he's not here. <laughs> so the first story that I like to tell is I've had a couple spontaneous healings. Um, those are moments where you really let go and let God, and you let go of the outcome in such a way that answered prayer manifests. And sometimes it's in accordance with the way that you design and you think, and other times it's not at all. It's something completely different. But one of my healings was uh, when I met Mark, I was an avid tennis player, mother of three, busy taking care of my children, living in Corona Del Mar in a beautiful home, and studying metaphysics. And I'd heard all this stuff about the power and the presence of God, but I got injured on the tennis court, and the injury was in my neck. And I had a neck ache for two months, and I almost had my head leaning to the side. I believe we were in the school of ministry at the time, and I had to ride in the back seat so that I could hold my head up, and it just went on and on. Dr. Mark was working in the pastoral care office at that time of the Huntington Beach Church of Religious Science. And I walked into that office, and I was mad. I stood in front of this little desk, and I said, you mean to tell me exactly as I am God is? And he said, exactly as you are. And this is how I was. <laughs> I was like, this can't be. He said, exactly as you are. And I walked away still mad, but turning over in my heart, in my thoughts. What does that mean? 
And what I didn't notice was every few minutes something was happening. What I didn't notice was something was lowering and easing as I was focusing on what does it mean that I don't feel perfect or that I don't look perfect. And within hours, my neck ache was gone. I'll always consider that my first healing with metaphysics and the beloved Dr. Mark. So I get to tell another story on him. Last summer, he was visiting me. And he said to me on uh, Saturday night, and he was doing one of his retreats. He took me on one of those, and I was like, mm, not me. So he would go all day and study and come back and stay in my house. And so um, he said on Saturday evening when he came in from his workshop, do you have a lesson for tomorrow? And I said, mm, not really. And he said, oh, well, it'll get here before tomorrow morning. And I said, I think I'll go look at your live streaming. He said, oh, no, you don't want to do that. I said, no, I think I'm going to do that. He said, oh, you won't like that. I said, no, no. And I went in my room, and I listened to one of the lessons on Facebook. Is it Facebook? Um, now, I can't tell you exactly what he said. But I can tell you something happened in me. First of all, I began to realize that I wasn't filling up any place. I wasn't opening and receiving. I was giving, but I wasn't opening. I wasn't listening. I am a hospice chaplain. And as a hospice chaplain, it's a very ecumenical kind of work. And I believe this theology is absolutely the best for that kind of work because we embrace so many different traditions. We don't believe that you have to think a certain way, except maybe we kind of do. I have a kid that we don't say the glass, she looks at the glass half empty, or she looks at the glass half full. I have a kid that we say is under the glass, always looking up from the bottom. We laugh about that. But we're sort of sad that she creates that which she puts out and continues to create it. Ernest Holmes said we should do anything and everything to live in the demonstration of our prayer. Anything and everything to live in answered prayer. Anything and everything sometimes means we have to let go. We have to let God. We have to step into, I don't know what answered prayer would look like. As a hospice chaplain, seeing lots of different people in different walks of life, one time I was standing with a group of chaplains. Most of them are of the Christian faith. That's a strong leaning for the chaplains in this country right now. Most of the people that we see are of every faith, even the non-faith. I like the people who say they're agnostic or they don't believe or they don't practice. They're atheists. It's not for them because those are sometimes the best conversations. But I know in my heart that I once thought everybody should be in metaphysics and new thought. I once thought everybody should think like I think because it's inclusive. I once thought yesterday that people who don't think like I do attract bad experiences, and maybe even deserve those experiences. But I'm judging. Even yesterday, when I prepared for the lesson today, I realized there are a couple of things that I could let go of. Thinking that something was wrong. Thinking that somebody wasn't doing something the right way. Thinking that they should do it differently instead of looking at them and seeing the presence of God right there, too. When I remembered yesterday that God was in the people that I was complaining about, literally, yesterday, oh, God brought those people to me. Oh, they're expressions of the divine. There are four sentences in the Bible about Melchizedek. Four sentences in the whole Bible. He, it's in Genesis 14. And Melchizedek is the king of Salem. And he comes to Abraham and he blesses him. 
Now, there's lots made up about who this is who comes and blesses, but it's a stranger. It's somebody that we don't know. And the Bible actually uses that as somebody that we don't know. Do you look at your strangers and think, you have a blessing for me? Do you look at your loved ones, those people who are the very closest to you, when they're doing something you don't agree with? Most of us would love to have our prayers answered, that our children wouldn't use the substances that they use, that our significant others would be more mindful of our theology, that people of other traditions would know what it means to really open our hearts and walk with the presence of God. Jesus told us, oh, I have to tell a little story on my grandson, Wyatt. I used to have a nickname for him until I realized that the other grandkids noticed I only had a nickname for one kid, so I was practicing favoritism. So I had to stop. I still do have a little bit of favoritism where this guy is concerned. He's being raised, he's 11, and he's being raised with his other grandmother in a fundamental church. They're very, they carry their Bible and they really talk about the Bible and they talk about the teachings of Jesus. And then he spends time with me. So I'm working a little bit more on being inclusive. So he says to me the other day, do you believe in Jesus? I said, well, he said, because you know, daddy and grandma don't. They don't think you do. I said, well, I do. I believe he was a master teacher. I believe he came with a great message, but I believe that part of his message is a little bit more about God than about being a human. My grandson, 11, looks up, and, and looking up is such a powerful thing. Looking up is actually good for us. Looking up bathes the brain with all the chemicals of balance. He looked up. And then he looked at me and he said, well, Granny, Jesus talked to God. How could Jesus be God? I was like, okay, he's getting this. He's getting something without even being educated. Then he says to me, who do they talk about in your church? My church only talks about Jesus. Does your church talk about God? And we do talk about God. But we recognize that God, the God that is within us, is the God that was within te in Jesus as a master teacher. So one of Jesus' stories that I think is powerful is the story about the paraplegic who is at the pool of Bethesda. And that man, the story is that when the waters ruffle, Actually, it means that when an angel comes down and goes just over the waters, the waters would ruffle, and the first person in the pool would be healed. That leper sat there, or that uh, paraplegic sat there for years and years and complained that no one helped him get into the pool when the water was ruffled. What Jesus says to him is, would you be healed? Then pick up your mat. Pick up your mat is the piece I want to really pay attention to here. Pick up your mat means with your challenge. It doesn't mean when you don't have that challenge anymore. If we looked at challenges, whether we look at what's going on on our planet right now, today it's kind of scary what's going on in our planet. And we can have compassion and concern for the otherness of anybody. Otherness, strangers, that person who has the ability to bless you, maybe your relative, maybe the person living in your house, maybe the person who's all the way across the country that you will never know. Who is the stranger to you that has come to bless you? And what would that blessing actually mean or be if you opened your heart and simply said in our teaching, and so it is. I love there's a meditation that talks about, uh, that doesn't talk at all. There's a meditation that's music, and in the background there's a chant. And you can't really even hear the chant unless you listen very carefully, and it's saying, so be it. And it just repeats, so be it, 
so be it. The universe is just like that chant. There's something in the universe that just keeps saying, so be it. Whatever you put in to the universe, what it gives back to you is, so be it. I will make it so. We should give anything and everything to live in answered prayer, to live in the demonstration. I like the idea of start with the end in mind. Start with the end in mind. So for me, starting today, sometimes at the end of Sunday morning, I've been a minister almost as long as Dr. Mark has, not quite. He got through the school of ministry because he didn't have children at home, a little faster than I did. <laughs> so he graduated a year before me. He's always been an amazing metaphysician and a deeply, deeply spiritual person. So when I was finding my way, looking for how to get there, sometimes I want to get angry with life. I don't know, maybe we all want to get angry with life. Is that anger with life the very thing that becomes the enemy? Is that enemy something that you just hold out and say, if this happened, then I would be okay? And the universe is saying to you, so be it. You may have anything that you put into the universe can manifest for you. And so if you're putting in, my enemies are irritating me, my children are irritating me, the dog next door is irritating me, the car alarm is irritating me. I liked the lesson of whatever it is that's irritating you. And I learned this from Michael Beckwith. Put your attention on that thing for just a moment. If it's irritating you, bring it in. Don't push it away. In our human experience, we quite often are pushing things away. We're pushing things out. There's a really good story of three monks who lived up on a beautiful piece of land that had once been a beautiful sanctuary and park. But over the years, people stopped coming. People stopped attending the services. People stopped picnicking on the lawns. And they, the funds began to dwindle. And pretty soon, the three monks up on the hill were just working to barely keep the place open. No one ever came and visited. One day, one of the monks went down the hill to the tavern to purchase some goods to take back up to the other two monks. He ran into a man who said, are you one of the monks that lives up on the hill? He said, well, yes, I am. He said, I hear one of you is the Messiah. He says, not me. It's not me. But he doesn't say it out loud. He just says under his breath, it's not me. He doesn't even spend any more time in town. He runs back up the hill because if it's not him, who is it? There's only two others there. So he says to the two others, I ran into a man downtown who said the Messiah is among us. And he looked at one, and then he looked at the other. They looked at the other. They looked at him. They fell silent. They fell silent. And then they went to their prayer. They went to their devotion. They went on about their business. They began to do the things that they just continued to do. But they kept looking at each other and wondering, who is it? Is it you? Is it you? Are you the Messiah? Pretty soon, people started to come back to the monastery. People came up the hill, not because they wanted to know who the Messiah was, but because the three men on the hill were behaving to each other differently and attracting, like unto themselves, people who began to return and worship, people who began to return and picnic, and over a very short period of time, the entire monastery was restored. I, a lot of people at church that have followed me in my church, I have reconnected with in Ventura. I just went back uh, three months ago. So three months is the longest time that I have not spoken in 20, 25, 28 years. So long time that I before I uh, ever before did not have a speak. This is my first time back, thank you. 
very grateful that uh, Dr. Mark invited me here. When I got to back to Ventura to uh, semi-retirement, I reconnected with some of the people who had been from my church. Those people said, I don't go to church anymore. One person, and everybody wanted to explain why they didn't go to church. Well, I followed you. It should have been com um, complimentary. Actually, to me, it was sort of like, you don't go to church anymore? Well, I'm sorry. I had lots of stories about why people weren't going to church anymore. One person came to me and said, I don't go to church anymore because I discovered that I need to follow the God within. That's the teaching. That's what we're teaching. You're not supposed to follow me. You're not supposed to follow Dr. Mark. I don't even think that Jesus said you were supposed to worship Jesus. I think that Jesus said, there's something within you. Find the journeys from here to here. Find that which is within you. And when you find that which is within you, Mine didn't say, don't go to church anymore. Mine didn't say, I don't have anything to share anymore. Mine said, now the work begins. Now the work begins. I got really sick a few years ago, really, really sick. And I was in the hospital for a brain tumor of all the things, a brain tumor. I was of the mind that if you got a brain tumor, that meant you had your papers, you were leaving. Only I didn't get to leave, I got to come back and do the work. Through the brain tumor experience, people said, did you tell them you were a minister? Did you tell everybody in the hospital who you are? I'm like, no, because you know what? I said explicatives every chance I could. <laughs> A guy came into my room with fragrance on. I'm like, out, out. I was not the kind of person that you wanted. But people said, but you have such a close connection. You got well because you're you. Well, maybe. But I think I got well because I got well. I think there's a power and a presence that's greater than I am. And it is the I am that I am. And it comes through me. And it healed me. And it said, now go back and do the work. So when we find that power within us, what does it say? We can become sloths. And we don't have to do anything anymore. Because I know where the power and presence is. You know, the Melchizedek story, Abraham then tithes 10% to the stranger. Tithes 10% to the stranger. What that power and presence in me reminds me to do is to continue to grow and stretch to love the stranger. Sometimes the strangers in myself, yesterday, the stranger was in me. The stranger was mad. The stranger didn't like some things that were going on, and she thought she could have her way and fuss and carry on, and I was going down, circling the drain, going to go down real soon, real fast, because that was not the answer. The minute I remembered God, and that's the story of Job. Job goes all the way down and down and down until he loses everything. And he sits with his really bad friends who say to him, what would you do to deserve this? And the minute he shifts from what did I do to deserve this, how did I get here, how did I create this, and that was part of my conversation yesterday, how did I create this, the minute Job said, oh, it doesn't matter. I have God. God is greater than I am. God is greater than you are. God is greater than anything, and God is everything. We, talking to those uh, chaplains, we stood together, all from different faiths, and said, what are we doing with prayer? Are we trying to fix, and this was in a clinical pastoral education class, which was across the street from a hospital with 360 patients. Are we praying, one of the chaplains said, that all those patients will get well and just stand up and walk out of the hospital? There's 5,000 people that work in that hospital to, 
provide for those 350 patients? What are we doing with prayer? Are we asking God to choose one person over another person? When we pray for our team to win, are we saying, God, this is the team, not this team? Or is God more on one team, the winning team, than on the other team? Are we listening? There's, in metaphysics, we think meditation is listening and prayer is directing. But I wonder if we don't get a little too busy directing and saying what it is we think we need or want instead of listening. What church is about today, especially if you believe that you brought God, is being together and sharing that you know. And when you share that you know, and the universe says, so be it, so be it, answered prayer becomes our reality. I am so grateful to be here this morning. Thank you for inviting me to share with you. Let's turn with him in prayer. Opening our hearts and minds to the power and presence of the one God. Recognizing that one God loves us so deeply, so greatly, that that power and presence gave us each other. And we are still one. One in the life and the breath and the being of the divine one with each other. Our work is most probably about that being together. Our work is probably the very thing that we wish would just go away so that we could be okay and be at peace and be one with God. But right now, exactly as I am, God is. Blessing me, empowering me, moving through me, and so from this place of conscious connection, we bless every person everywhere who would be infected or affected by a virus. We bless a world that is in alarm about something that we need to wake up to and respond to. We bless those in our lives that we love, that are precious, precious, precious unto us. And we bless those in our lives that look like strangers. And we ask that we may step forward in this day and recognize the presence of God in all. For that is the blessing. We are grateful for this day, for this time, for this word, for being together. We know that it is a sacred blessing. We give thanks to God. We let go of our word, letting it be good and very good. And so it is. Amen. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed. I am so blessed, I am so grateful, I am so blessed. Please repeat after me. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly.